Hi folks, okay, this is the first video I'm going to do on sort of background or big picture issues uh, behind what's going on in your Frega reading, you know, this article on sense and reference. I talked a little bit about this stuff in the one lecture we've had on philosophy of language before the strike happened and then face-to-face um, -face classes were suspended. Uh, it's been a while even for those of you who were there, so I figure it's probably useful to go over this stuff again. Um, and I have had at least one person specifically contact me and say uh, it would be helpful to talk about the big picture issues here, uh, the motivation behind the, the questions that philosophers like Frege are answering in your readings. So that's what this, met, this uh, video is on. I'll do a separate one trying to go through in detail the first couple pages of that Frege reading. That's the other thing that we did in that one lecture we had. Okay, so this is a class, it, or this half of the module is a class in the philosophy of language. Why is that a thing we should care about? I guess a lot of other philosophy topics that I teach for first and second year students, I'll often start by trying to elicit your intuitions about whatever the thing is that we're interested in. So if we're doing epistemology, if we're um, going to do the, the philosophy of knowledge, I might ask you questions to try and tease out what your concept of knowledge already is, how you talk about it, when it matters, that sort of thing. Um, likewise, if I'm going to teach you about free will, we might talk about what do you think it takes for an action to be free? When does it matter if uh, something's freely chosen as opposed to goers? That's not really the way that I'd introduce the big questions here. There's... We can at least agree, I think, sort of right off the bat, that there's some kind of phenomenon here whereby certain, let's say, sounds we make with our mouths or uh, marks we make on paper or on some other surface um, somehow manage to refer to things in the world, right? Certain marks that we make, certain sounds that we make have meanings. And you might think it's a little bit mysterious how that works. Why is it that, you know, a, a, this series of squiggles here, I, I hope you can see my cursor, uh, why this series of squiggles means something like sense, or why it... Actually, that's an awkward choice because it's sort of mysterious what senses are. But, like this series of squiggles here, spelling out Kant, that that somehow picks out a particular human being from history. Why did those squiggles do that? I mean, one sort of uh, simple-headed answer is because we've agreed that that's what that'll do. Why does that first letter that we call K, why does that tell us to make the sound K with our sounds? Well, d just because we all agree that that's what it's going to do. It's kind of arbitrary. We could have agreed some other shape would mean that. Um, in different languages, even the same letter might mean different sounds. But we just agree that that's what that, uh, what that mark on paper tells us to do with our mouths if we want to read the thing out loud. And likewise, we might think the reason why the sound Kant or that series of marks on papers, K-A-N-T, um, means a certain person is because we all agree that it does. How did we agree that? Well, uh, something to do with Kant's parents picking that name, rules for who's allowed to pick a name. But this simple-headed answer doesn't get us all that far because, well, because of how much we can do with language and how much structure there is in human languages in general. Um, if I were a little more technologically savvy, uh, or if we were doing this in person, I would insert a, a YouTube clip here of uh, a clip from um, uh, Fry and Laurie in the 80s, a little bit of sketch comedy. I, uh, I can put a link in the description. That's a thing that YouTube people say. I'll figure out how to do that after I finish recording. Um, point is, th the point I want to get from that clip is there are infinitely many... Um, 
meaningful sentences of English, not only that are meaningful, but where as soon as you hear them, even if nobody's ever said it before in history, you will know right away what it means. It might be a little confusing. There might be a reason why nobody said it before in history, but as long as the words are all meaningful and they're put together grammatically, you can sort of figure out what kind of thing it's saying. Um, you can understand what it means. And you can, not only can you do that, I mean, special as you are, this isn't a unique fact about you. If you said a sentence like this, I mean, when Stephen Fry utters this strange thing about the waiter holding his nose, you'll see in the clip. Uh, when he says this kind of thing, not only does he know what it means, but he can expect with full confidence that any competent speaker of English who um, hears the sentence will know what he means. Okay, infinitely many different sentences, possible sentences that are still meaningful. How is it that we can understand those things? It's not, it can't be that we have infinitely many, um, you know, different representations stored in our minds, one for each sentence. Rather, there's something systematic going on. Part of what um, somebody like Frege is interested in is figuring out how that systematicity works. So if the way that uh, language works, the way that we are able to recognize, to understand, uh, to expect other people to understand all those infinitely many sentences is that we all sort of memorize finitely many words in our vocabulary, finitely many grammatical rules that tell you here are ways you can produce uh, meaningful English sentences. And then we, you know, put those rules together, uh, apply them to whatever words in the vocabulary we're using. Okay, if that kind of picture is, explains how we're able to understand all these infinitely many sentences, then you might very well want to say, okay, well, I want more detail. Um, how does that system work? What are the rules? Is it just is it is it just the grammar? Is it something that arbitrary? I mean, you might think even the grammar, the grammatical rules are kind of um, arbitrary. So, like in English, we typically have uh, we put words in the order subject, verb, object. Um, I ate the cookie. I subject ate verb the cookie object. Other languages put things in other orders. Um, I think German usually puts the verb at the end. I don't actually know much German. Uh, but okay, as long as we're interested in these kinds of uh, rules and structures, you might think that there would be, you might expect that there would be something more universal that isn't arbitrary to one language or another. I mean, what happens if some group of people, some um, uh, culture has certain rules in the grammar that become the rules of their language because they all agree those are going to be the rules, but they make a mistake and there's like something wrong with the rules and they don't fit together well. Um, I mean, you guys have been following um, British politics for the last few years. You know that trying to come up with rules that make things do what you want can be difficult and you can't always have a, I mean, ugh, we don't need to talk about that stuff. Okay, so I think part of what's going on in Frege's philosophy of language here is trying to get the details of not what's peculiar to German or any other language, um, but trying to figure out how language works in general, how human linguistic um, speech and, I think, thought is structured. How is it that uh, we manage to say things and think things that are about the world? And what can we learn about how to structure our thoughts well, so that in a way that's suited to doing science, in a way that's suited to investigating the way the world is? Um, Frege is at least as much a mathematician as he is a philosopher. Um, I think in the background for a lot of this, he wants to, he cares about 
having very precise language that's suited for doing mathematics in a way that isn't going to run us into problems, that's going to allow us to investigate um, the world, and in particular the mathematical world. Okay, that's something he cares about. Let me give you one more um, thing in the neighborhood, a principle in the neighborhood that Frege is committed to that I think is going to help us understand what's going on in uh, the rest of this paper. So this is a principle called compositionality. Let's see if this tool works. Compositionality, I think you can see that. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, one of your readings, there's a, a, a short bit I ask you to read from a long textbook, uh, the Hyman Kratzer, Kratzer textbook, um, pages one to three. They're talking about Frege, and they talk about compositionality, so they explain this principle in a bit more detail. Here's roughly the idea. Um, compositionality says... I'm going to just say this roughly, the meaning of a sentence or of a complex name is determined by the meanings of the parts of the sentence or the complex name and the way those parts are put together. So let me give you um, a couple of examples. Let's type some of these in. So here's a complex name that is a noun phrase, something that uh, picks out a particular thing or person, um, but isn't something simple like just the name Kant. So let's take uh, there. There's something that has parts, right? It's not just the name Kant. It's a complex name. It's The parts are Kant and the possessive apostrophe s and the word mother. So this picks out a certain woman, the one who, probably the one who gave birth to Kant or who raised him. I guess who who's really your mother is a complicated question. Uh, so there's a complex name. Let me give you a sentence. Um, Kant's mother was a woman. Okay, easy enough. Now. I don't know what meanings are yet exactly. There are lots of different things that we might call a meaning, but I, when I stated this principle of compositionality, I talked in terms of meanings. Uh, let me write up, let me write down, but I, I kind of don't want to write it down because this is be, supposed to be rough. The meaning of a question, uh, sorry, of a sentence is determined by the meanings of its parts and the way they're put together. The important thing to get here is we're saying the meaning of a sentence is determined by the meanings of its parts. Notice it's not saying the meaning of a sentence is determined by its parts, which is also true, right? What's the meaning of this? Well, it's determined by the fact that we use the word Kant, the particle, apostrophe as, yes. um, maybe particle is the wrong word, whatever, the possessive bit, and the word mother. What compositionality says is if we care about the meaning of the thing as a whole, then what matters about each of the parts is what they mean. So that entails that if I were to replace some part of this name or this sentence with another part that has the same meaning, then the meaning of the thing as a whole shouldn't be changed. So uh, the philosopher Kant, his first name was Emmanuel, so I'm going to say this. If we say Kant and Emmanuel mean the same thing. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Depends what you mean by meaning. We'll get on to that. Uh, if Kant and Emmanuel mean the same thing, then Kant's mother and Emmanuel's mother must also mean the same thing. Okay, different things a meaning could be. If you like a sense and a reference, 
are two kinds of meaning. So we might apply compositionality to each of them and say, the sense, you don't know what a sense is yet. That's the next video, don't worry. You don't know what a reference is either. Next video, don't worry. The sense of a sentence is determined by the senses of its parts and the way they're put together. The reference of a sentence is determined by the references of its parts and the way they're put together. Okay, a lot of the arguments that we'll see in this paper from Frege involves these making these kinds of substitutions. So we say, I, I have reason to think that this word and this word have the same reference, so I should be able to substitute one for the other in a, in a larger sentence without changing the reference of the entire sentence, and that'll, you know, create problems, make predictions, that sort of thing. Okay, I think that's all the background we need for now just to get started. So I'm going to end this recording here and start talking about the paper itself, the arguments that we find there. Um, if there's anything I can say more about, send me email, or I guess you could comment on YouTube. That seems like a... Yeah. Send me email.